Moving forward, or are we, on wars in Ukraine and Israel, on climate, on college campuses, and on our fight with inflation? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, Rick Reeder of BlackRock on where we're headed in 2024. I really think the U.S. economy doesn't go into recession except for pandemic, financial crisis, unless it's some big exogenous shock. Former IBM head Sam Palmasano on efforts to keep tech innovation on the rails. The issue with AI is going to be responsible use. And Glenn August of Oak Hill Advisors on what comes next in distressed investing. The extraordinary thing that we're facing is a trillion plus dollars of debt that's coming due over the next three, four years. It was hard for Global Wall Street to tell this week whether we were really making progress on issues that have lingered through the years and on some of more recent vintage. Climate certainly has been an agenda, at least to talk about, for a long time. This week, the COP28 summit wrapped up in the UAE with the man who led it declaring victory. Though we'll have to wait to see whether actions live up to all those words. The war in Ukraine continues, with President Zelensky bringing his message to Washington that he needs more help. Though, once again, there was more encouraging talk than there was action from Congress. It was a very powerful meeting. President Zelensky made it so clear how he needs help. But if he gets the help, he can win this war. We passed the two-month mark in Israel's war with Hamas, and pressure mounted to curtail Israeli operations in Gaza. While college presidents back in the United States face the spillover on their campuses of issues triggered by the Middle East, leading to the University of Pennsylvania losing its president. There is uh, a real justification for the Penn president stepping down, and I believe the other two should come under the exact same scrutiny. The U.S. economy kept humming along, with inflation continuing to slow, but that 2% target still evasive. We are seeing inflation slowing, and it's consistent with what the Fed expects. The last mile of the inflation journey is often the most difficult. And then on Wednesday, the Federal Reserve once again stood pat on rates, but made it clear it pretty much is done with rate hikes and is at least starting to talk about some cuts. The question of when will it become, become appropriate to begin dialing back the amount of policy restraint in place, that, that begins to come into view uh, and is clearly a discussion, topic of discussion out in the world and, and also a discussion for us uh, at, at our meeting today. And it was that news out of the Fed that drove the markets for the week, with the S&P 500 jumping even as the Fed chair was speaking and adding ultimately 2.5% for the week overall to end up at 47.19. That is way above the median number for our Bloomberg L's, and they projected that for the end of this year and is more than 200 points above where they think we'll end up next year. The Nasdaq closed on Friday at an all-time high after adding 2.85%, while the yield on the 10-year dropped nearly 32 basis points to end the week under 4% at 3.91. To take us through where, what we've just seen, we welcome now back Barbara Reinhardt. She's Voya Investment Management CIO and Multi-Asset Strategy and Solutions. So Barbara, thanks for being back with us. Great to have Thank you here. Thank you. So what did we see? I don't know if the Fed chair expected that kind of reaction. He sure got it. Did the markets overreact? Well, I think you always have to put it into context. So for just about the past seven weeks, the markets have been starting to price in much better inflation data. Just remember, at the end of the third quarter in September, bond markets were getting very nervous. Yields were climbing close to 5%. And there was some concern that the Fed was still going to be increasing interest rates. But I think with the slowing that you've seen in the economy and the slowing that you've seen in the employment data and the good progress on inflation, the Fed was really able to bring the message home to the markets this year. It may indeed be a bit ahead of what the Fed had wanted. You saw John Williams today from the New York Fed saying, uh, everyone, just a moment, hold your horses. Uh, but we do think that the progress that's been made on inflation is real, and we do see the economy slowing. But looking into next year, because it's time now to start thinking about next year, have they steered that difficult course between recession on the one hand and continued inflation on the other? Have they managed that, do you think? We think so. At Voya, we have a number of uh, inflation probability uh, indicators and models that we'd like to look at. And we're forecasting less than a 30% chance of a recession in 2024. In fact, if the data continues on this road that it's on, we think it's probably even likely that you wouldn't see a recession much before 2025. 
Wow. So what does that say to the investor going into 2024? I mean, what, what is different now than it was six months ago, for example? Well, let's put some things in context, David. Over the past two years, the S&P 500 has made very little headway. While stocks are up almost 20 percent this year, they were down almost 20 percent last year. So since December of 2021, you've basically been flat on the equity market, which is very unusual. We do see earnings able to climb about 10 percent over the course of 2024. And if bond yields continue to, to fall modestly, you know, if you can get rates down to about three and a half percent, you might be able to get a little bit of multiple expansion. That should give you 10 to 12 percent in equities over the course of 2024. I would say it will not be smooth and there will be bumps along the way. But there's reasons to be optimistic. But that's the case for equities. Mm -hmm. If I'm trying to decide that 60-40 split between mm -hmm. equities and bonds going into 2024, which do you think you tilt more toward, the bonds? Because bonds are looking more attractive than they did certainly mm -hmm. in recent years. Over the very short term, I would say this. Over the past seven weeks, most people have really started to pile into the equity market. Most of our sentiment indicators that we look at in terms of short-term temperature of the markets are looking quite extended at this point. Mm -hmm. You're susceptible to any type of garden variety pullback at this point, just like we had in the summer. There was a 10 percent peak to trough decline. Um, but I would say the reason that bonds ha have real yields at this point, you're about 1.7 percent on a real 10 year Treasury. That is great news to asset allocators and investors alike. It means that you're getting a return on bonds in excessive inflation. It's the first time I can tell you we've had positive real yields sustainably since the global financial crisis. So it's a great time for investors to be looking at the actual value and the material value that's in the fixed income markets. Right now, it looks like the, the, we have a rising tide, which is lifting most of the boats, right. I think it's fair to say. As you look into 2024, where do you think some boats might get more of a lift and some right. less? Well, it's interesting, David. So when you think about the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates, you immediately go to some really heavy cyclical parts of the market that should do very well. U.S. small caps have been on a tear since uh, the Federal Reserve started to say that they were going to be potentially not raising interest rates and even nudging them down. But there are some other parts of the market that should have been doing better, but they're not. So something like the emerging markets, you would expect them to do very well when the Fed is taking their boot off the neck of the markets. They have lagged behind significantly, in part because while they're leveraged to the global interest rate cycle, their underlying fundamentals are not particularly strong at this time. So I think you have to be careful when you're talking about the rising tides lifting all the boats. We would definitely stay look, um, allocated more towards the U.S. than the rest of the world. Europe is still in recession. I'm concerned that the yen may not rally as much as everyone expects this year. And I think the emerging markets are still in trouble. So for us, we're keeping our U.S. home country bias very much alive and well for well, 2024. Within that U.S. home country bias, one of the biases we've all had is the Fed. Yes. We, it seems like every single day all we care about is the Fed. Is that going to continue in 2024? <clears throat> are we ever going to get past the point where all we care about is what the Fed thinks it's doing <laughs> or we think it's doing? David, that's a great question. And we all have, have had the Fed on the brain since really 2021. Um, I think the real issue that we're going to have to face in 2024 that's going to change the market's view is going to be the U.S. presidential election. Over the past couple of elections that we've had, say 2020, 2016, uh, 2004, 2000 as well, it's kind of been this pattern that follows. The market tends to make some decent gains into the beginning of the year, really the first half. And then right around the June primaries, the market starts to say, hmm, there's some things that could be uncertain about this election. Could it be another Supreme Court decided election? Is it too difficult to determine who the winner is going to be? And the market tends to get a little bit nervous. The equity market generally has a weak third quarter. And then right around October, there starts to be enough information that the market starts to sniff out who the winner is going to be. And then equities generally march higher into the end of the year. And we would see that as likely replaying this year. That June timing could be tricky because mm -hmm. everybody, even the Fed, agrees we're going to be slowing down the economy through mm -hmm. the first half of the year. Mm -hmm. You could have a slowing economy. I'm not necessarily going into negative, but mm -hmm. a lot more modesty is now. At the same time, you have that market uncertainty. Yeah. In the middle of the year, what you're saying, I think, is it could be tricky. It could be very, it could be very choppy for sure. So why we think that you're going to make decent gains in 2024, in part because your starting point is relatively good, uh, it could be a bumpy 2024 for sure. It's fascinating. Okay. Any hedges you recommend? Uh, none at this moment, but thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's always great to have you with us, Barbara. That's Barbara Reinhardt of Voya. Coming up, getting the best tech has to offer without letting it get out of control. 
We talk with former chairman and CEO of IBM, Sam Palmisano, about his new approach to that problem. That's next on Wall Street Week, and we are on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Global Wall Street spent much of 2023 focused on tech, including ways in which artificial intelligence could change our world. And so much of what tech can do depends critically on the data it uses. Large amounts of it, by the way, and the quality of that data it consumes. Sam Palmasano ran IBM as chairman and CEO. Among other things, he now co-chairs the Data and Trust Alliance, which has just released proposed data standards on behalf of 19 companies. And we welcome Sam now back to Wall Street Week. So welcome. It's good to have you back here. So, so first of all, why'd you start with data? There's a lot of concerns about artificial intelligence and what it might do. Why'd you start with data? Well, it's interesting. It's a good question. Ken Chanel and I, my partner, the co-chair in this thing, got together a couple years ago and said the issue with AI is going to be responsible use. And how can you as an enterprise use it responsibly because it can be transformational. This is before all the excitement of GPT-4 and all the things that have occurred now, right? And so we formed this consortium of 20, now 26 companies. It's like Walmart, Nike, Pfizer, Humana, American Express, I mean, NFL, big guys, and enterprise guys, right? And got together, and one of the key projects that they thought we should focus on was data. The first one was on bias in data and HR practices, which was somewhat straightforward compared to, let's say, quality of data on the internet. And they came up with a whole set of procedures that they implemented, processes, et cetera. And the most recent one that their teams worked on was the quality of the data. And then how do you responsibly use that data so you can build trust? Because a large enterprise, whether you're in uh, consumer packaged goods or you're in finance or whatever it happens to be, you have to have a trusted relationship with the information that you're using to either attract customers or transfer funds or fraud, whatever it happens to be. Is there some self-enforcing here, I wonder, as I read about this, for example, if I use some data that is, has this metadata attached to it that says, for example, there are privacy restrictions uh, or there are origins, there's more questionable. Right. If I use those data and things go wrong, somebody could come in and say, wait a second, you knew that there were restrictions that you didn't obey. Well, that's an excellent question. So we're assuming you're ethical. <laughs> that's the assumption. Now, these companies, obviously, as you can imagine, the names that are part of this consortium, I don't worry about the leadership of those countries. It doesn't mean there won't be those issues. That means you need to have what I used to call in the old cyber days, you might recall, the, the carrot and the stick, mm -hmm. i.e., the, the stick is if you don't comply with the standards associated with the proper so cyber process and you have a major hack, then you're liable. But if you comply, the carrot is then you'll be giving some form of grace period to cure. Uh, I think it applies here. It's the same thing. As, but now, the standard has to emerge, to be fair. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be complicated and take time. Uh, regulation is on steroids, which is in many ways appropriate because it could drive quality. If it does drive quality and transparency, it's working. But the regulators, as you know, there'll be more in that than that. But from an enterprise perspective, that's the most important thing. But it's back to the same thing. It, can it be self-policing in the sense that if you haven't given an accurate explanation and therefore something bad happens, well, you're liable for that. On the flip side of that, data is an asset. It has value. Yes. So if people did adopt this and it worked, could data sets be more valuable than they might otherwise be if you didn't have the metadata attached? Now you're getting into something that's extremely complicated because the answer is yes, but then how do you value the asset? We've done a lot of work on a balance sheet because a lot of these assets are data and software. And they're not tangibles like a building or equipment or a tool or whatever it happens to be. So in the economic model of these things, it's a little more complicated. But your point is absolutely correct intellectually that it is an asset. It's an asset of the enterprise. It's also an asset of the individual. I mean, if you want to get into the consumer, that is your data. That is your asset. And the fact how that data is being used, you should participate in its uses. I'd argue if it's an economic value, you should share in the economic value. Now that hasn't occurred as to yet, but I do think some of the solutions here is make it almost a commercial relationship between the user and the, and the service provider 
so that if they are using the data correctly and you've complied, that's fine, and you get some economic value, whatever that, it could be free services, whatever that happens to be. How is this working, or do you anticipate it would work across borders? Because this is a global business, yes. as a part of it. particularly when you get into uh, generative AI, it's global necessarily. Is your vision that this would apply across borders, and yes, let me say, even to China? Well, if you left China out, I'd say yes. <laughs> now we're going to get more complicated. Or any, any, any authoritarian government that uses the information for, we would do not as open democratic principles, right? That's a complicated, let's just take a, the more straightforward world. Let's talk about, say, the West, right? A lot of these companies, as, as you know, operate around the world in all these places. So they're, they'll, they will implement these approaches that they say they're going to adopt. Our hope is that we'll get more participation from companies outside the United States that will do the same thing. But the, where we began, there are a couple of companies that have been involved that were non-domiciled in the U.S., but it's not a larger portion of the 26. It's a couple. So we really think that by if these large, like a Walmart adopts, people around the world are well, these guys don't know what they're doing, or Nike, you know, all these companies that operate everywhere else, that will get up the adoption rate. That's our hope. Sam, it's always good to have you on Wall Street. We thank you so much. That's Sam Palmasano. He is co-chair of the Data and Trust Alliance. Coming up, Rick Reeder of BlackRock joins us to explain his latest venture, Rick's second fixed income ETF from the leader in the field. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Exchange-traded funds have grown dramatically, hitting a record $10 trillion in assets this year. BlackRock is the leading provider of ETFs, and we welcome back now Rick Reeder. He's BlackRock Chief Investment Officer of Global Fixed Income and head of the Global Allocation Team. Rick, welcome back to Wall Street Week. Good to have you. Thanks for having me. So this week, you announced a second mm -hmm. uh, ETF. You announced one back in May uh, mm -hmm. that was a flexible income, as I recall. Now, this is total return. Yeah. Why did you do it? So a couple of things, as you said, I mean, they, there's been an explosion of demand for ETFs. It's a pretty incredible how the industry has developed and how clients are looking more for things that are liquid, transparent, use them for tax strategies, build models, and the models allow you to be dynamic around putting ETFs in. And, and so there's a whole new co cohort of investors and existing clients that say, gosh, the ETF wrapper is a really effective one. So we are taking a lot of our strategies, and so the one we're launching now is our total return strategy, very close to what is the mutual fund. Um, and, but it gives people who want to use that wrapper, it gives them the ability to do it. And you know, we launched this income fund that is roughly similar to a fund we run called, uh, called SIO, Strategic Income Opportunities. But boy, it's gotten the receptivity to it, the, the rate at which it's grown. And some of it is because it's an income producing 7% yield in an environment like this with a low volatility to it. Similar, people are coming into high yield, but this is actually lower volatility, so it's gotten a tremendous amount of, uh, of attention, people putting money in, and so we're launching this one, which is more of total return, like when people do 60-40, this would be the 40. And so an ag index like, but we use a lot of strategies to generate more return than the index. So that's why it's gotten a lot of attention, and I think you'll see a lot of people say, particularly now with rates having backed up, gosh, equities have had a good go. I'm going to look for some fixed income and total return is a nice match to your, to your equity portfolio. If I'm putting together a portfolio, and let's assume I want some ETFs in it, uh, how do I choose your ETFs as opposed to some, some others? I mean, how does this fit into my portfolio? What does it balance against? So, I mean, I said one thing about fixed income, and I, you know, I run a lot of equity portfolios and fixed income portfolios. The one thing about fixed income is there 68,000 fixed income securities versus you know the S&P 500. There are 68,000 and your ability to create additional return by using your research, your analytics, your quant. Fixed income market to most investors is a pretty opaque market. It's just hard to figure out, should I buy a double A CLO, a triple A commercial mortgage backed security? So the benefit of, and, and one of the secrets to fixed income for so many years is if you can run more income than the index, but then manage your volatility, because a lot of parts of the index are inefficient, they're too rich, they're in, and so you cut out the bad stuff, and then you build a lot of income and you can outperform, and most managers, ourselves included, most managers in fixing them outperform, outperform indices. You know, what well, we think we're, we're pretty good at, 
is we use so much analytics, risk management, you know, increasingly artificial intelligence, looking at data signals. You know, our research allows us to look at collateral under a, under a mortgage, residential commercial mortgage. So, you know, the ability to tap into our resources to try and create, you know, real return when income is now so beneficial is, uh, is something that I think, you know, why, why I think people will, will invest in it. This is an active investment, as I understand. Correct. Uh, which is important. I mean, you, you did get that Morningstar Award, yes, sir. Best Portfolio Manager Thank in 2023, you. Thank you. Uh, which is featured. So if I'm looking at various alternatives, how much of this is betting on Rick Reeder and his team yeah. being able to manage all that complicated world of bonds that you just described? Yeah, so it's a great question. I've never been asked that in, 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 in a couple of different So we launched the first one, which is this income fund. And that is very much an aggressive, we'll look at things like European investment grade, European high yield emerging markets. And so it's very much an aggressive, because we're trying to keep our income high, you know, 7% income when an index is five-ish. So that is very much tapping into, because we're taking risk to get that, to get that yield. Total return is still, you know, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to beat the index, but we're more tethered to the index. I mean, it should be much more sincere to the aggregate index. So people should count on it doing interest rate wise, credit wise, relative to the index. So when people put it in their portfolio against equities, they should look at it relative to that. We've had a really good track record, knock, knock wood, of uh, beating the index. And so, you know, but, but the differentiation in total return, we are going to be more index oriented. We're just going to try and create an extra 100 basis points or so over that index over time versus my income one. We're just going to try and create a lot of income for you persistently. Now, I'll pay a little something for that active management. I yes. think it's 40 basis points. Is that where we yep. are, basically? Yep. You have some competition. You're the big guy still yep. in ETFs, mm -hmm. but you've got some big guys coming up behind you, people like Vanguard, for example. Yes, How much of this is competing on price at this point, where people say, I just want to get the fees down? You know, it's a great question. And, and you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm in the managing of the portfolio, so I don't get really get into the commercial aspect of it so much. But I will say, I will say one thing, that in fixed income particularly, that I think people look for firms that have a lot of resources that can really go global, can look at sectors. Do you want to buy the two, you know, the two year? Do you want to buy seven years? Do you want to use a little of your illiquidity bucket? That I think scale and fixed income is a really, really big deal. And I think having resources to create that scale, I think, is really important. So, and you know, the one thing I've learned about ETFs, equity and debt, scale is a big deal. You, you look at over time how certain ETFs become dominant. And even though the fee is, uh, is a bit higher, because you have so much liquidity and because you know it's going to do what you expect it to do, then people are comfortable, are comfortable with that. And I think that's been the right approach. Uh, so when you talk about scale, Rick, uh, how high can these trees grow toward the sky? There's a lot of talk about, in fact, the ETFs overtaking mutual funds by the end of the decade. So I think in mutual funds, I think, I think, are, a, um, I think are a very effective platform. So, you know, I could do a little bit different in terms of things I could do in our mutual fund. I tend to do more where I can do single name financing in the mutual fund. I can I use more hedges. You know, I'll use, I do a lot of things to hedge my risk using options, et cetera, which I don't use as much of in the, in the ETF. So I think the mutual fund wrapper is durable. But uh, yes, if you said me the direction of travel, our ETFs going to grow f significantly faster and, power and overtake mutual funds, whatever funds. I, th I think so. I think so because people love the transparency, love the models, so they can put them in models, and obviously this, you can manage tax effectively through it. So my sense is the growth will be f will be continue to be faster there. Rick Reeder is going to be staying with us as we turn to the new year and Rick's thoughts on what's ahead for investors. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Out with the old year and in with the new. Looking back on it now, 2023 had its fair share of surprises for investors as the effective funds rate climbed from the low fours at the beginning of the year to the mid fives by the end. That's really a question about what the level of rates will be going for, what the neutral level will be. And I think it's, it's very hard to know confidently what the answer to that will be in five years. Normally, those higher rates would be bad for stocks, but the S&P 500 rose over 20 percent, starting the year around 3,800 and ending up more than 700 points. 
West Texas Intermediate Crude started the year just over $75 a barrel, and after a spike when Israel went to war with Hamas, ended the year actually lower, hovering around $70 a barrel. So what does 2024 hold in store? Quite possibly Fed rate cuts, but according to PIMCO, not until later in the year. Right now, at least I'm not pricing in a recession for next year, but I do expect a, a slow growth environment in the U.S. with the potential for recession risk, particularly outside of the U.S. That you know could open the door for rate cuts towards the end of next year, um, but it's unlikely that we're going to see rate cuts in the first quarter. Kate Moore of BlackRock thinks there may be even further upside in stocks. I don't think even if it's in a slower growth environment from an economic perspective, we're likely to see another big hit to earnings. And so I think there's a lot of a great ripe fruit to be plucked next year. And for oil, it will likely turn in part on whether Saudi Arabia gets the results it wants from the cuts it imposed this year. Our concern is that Saudi said they'll push through Q1 with cuts. But by the time you get to Q2, and if demand isn't strong enough seasonally, you could see Saudi dump the market and try and make everyone honest again. Rick Reeder of BlackRock has stayed with us. So, Rick, we had a very eventful 2023. Let's look forward to 2024. And I guess one thing setting it up is actually what Jay Powell said here just this week at the end of 2023 about the possibility of rate cuts. Boy, he, he really embraced it, if anything. It was pretty incredible, David. I mean, I, you know, it was, uh, it was very different than we were a, a, literally a couple of weeks ago, certainly in the last meeting. And that was, you know, that was pretty aggressive. I think it is the right direction of travel. You know, if you look at inflation, I mean, six month CPI, core PCE are all trending down aggressively. I mean, we look at numbers over six month moving averages. Service inflation is still a bit sticky, but the averages are coming down well into the twos. Core PCE, we think by January is in the twos. So, I think it was the right thing to move it. What was surprising is how fast. I thought there would be a more of a transition to it. Listen, the long-term funds rate is 2.5%. The Fed projections, what they put in that data yesterday, they had real GDP of 1.5, and they have core PC at 2.5. That's pretty normal. I mean, that is, if you said over time, 1.5 one growth, 2.5 inflation, maybe get two inflation down to 2 at, at some point, but it's not that far. We've got a funds rate. That's five and three eighths percent. That real rate is really high. The Fed has to get rates down, has to start to move them down. I thought they would take a bit of time because of financial conditions, managing financial conditions. I thought they'd take a bit more time, but I think the direction of travel is right. And I think they are moving in a direction that is, that is the right thing. By the way, that real rate actually climbs as inflation goes down, right? Correct. So to some extent, they have to come down to just keep the same level of restrictiveness. So, so what Chair Powell said, and he said at the last meeting, too, they asked, are you focused on nominal or real rates? And he said it again, you focus on the real rate of interest. If they focus on the real rate of interest, definitionally, if inflation is two and a half, you know, you think about over time, the real rate of interest is closer to zero to one, running 3% real rates, too high. He's got to at least get it down 100 basis points, and I think he's got to get it down 200 basis points because growth is slowing. And he talked about you're starting to see more balance in the labor force. Virtually every indicator is showing still solid, but more balance alongside of inflation coming down. So the, the real rate definitionally, per the way they've described their focus, has to come down, and I and I think they're going to get started. Quite frankly, you know, I think they're going to get started in May, but could they start a little bit earlier? If possible. Uh, what does that tell me as an investor? I mean, bonds have had a tough time as those rates went up. Yeah. The bonds really took it on the chin, so to speak. Uh, what does that say for 2024 in terms of bonds? So I'd say one thing. I don't know. I brought a chart. I don't know if you have that chart that shows that there was. We just went through the most extraordinary uh, drawdown on the bond market. So for three years you had this extraordinary drawdown that was literally a 20% return. Down. I mean, we were to the point where long bonds were trading. There was one of the long bond trades at 47 and a half cents on the dollar. Nobody thinks AAA Treasuries should trade at 47 and a half cents on the dollar, but they were issued in 20 post COVID. And now they've, they've come under this incredible pressure. So now I, I, I did this presentation today where I called it that, you know, the only way to make a big splash is you need the diving board to be really high. How does the diving board get really high? It's when losses happen before it, and you just build the levels in terms of your upside potential return. I think next year, if you believe, which I believe, and the Fed has, has presaged that we are going to start to bring their rate down, you can create a lot of income in portfolios, and I think the total return performance is going to be really good. We, can, we build portfolios today that are still 6.5%. 
And by the way, for for in, we're building, we're buying we're buying assets in Europe now, two and three year investment grade European assets at as a dollar investor you're getting at six and a quarter. They were financing at negative interest rates back in 2021. Negative. Now we're at six and a quarter. Listen, I think the return. I mean, I think you can clip six percent, six and a half percent yield that can turn into double digit return. You could get a ten if they bring the rate down. So when people think about their equity debt portfolio, you know, equities just had a really good go. I think there's a huge amount of money sitting in money market funds. It's been very comfortable not losing money in bonds, clipping five and a half percent. That says, oh my God, I may lose the five and a half. I should start, I can start taking advantage of these rates because we're probably not going to get them a year from now. Uh, risk of uh, inflation coming back. That's the concern that maybe yeah. they're backing off too fast yeah. and it would come back. It, it, by the way, the CPI numbers about this week were reasonably sticky. I mean, they were not bad, yeah, but yeah, they were yeah. sticky. So here's why I'm confident. So I'll say one part. Let's start with the sticky part. Service level inflation is hard to bring down. There's a series of things. What drives it? Insurance, hard to bring. Healthcare insurance, auto insurance, hard. You know, look at medical services, aging demographic, hard, hard to bring that down. Shelter, we don't build enough houses today. Shelter is hard to bring down. So its services are sticky. Is services going to get to three and a half percent inflation? I think so. Goods are deflating. The last last six months, uh, CPI goods inflation is actually negative. But you can be pretty confident. Supply chain, logistics, technology, you know, getting increasingly more productivity in, in that. You can be pretty confident the goods part of the economy is very stable and will stay low. And services, you know, service economy, service inflation doesn't move, generally doesn't move around, unless you have a pandemic, doesn't move around that much. So you can get comfortable that we can stay in and around, on average, high twos now trending to low twos inflation. But can you blip up a little bit? If you, it's, it's certainly possible. But you know, I think it's really important. The Fed doesn't really move insurance prices. The Fed doesn't really move healthcare prices. Those are not cyclical. The Fed should focus on where their influence is, and that's a cyclical part of the economy, which is quite clear in that it's moderating. Let me take the flip side of it. Going into 2023, mm -hmm. there were a lot of economists who were predicting a recession this year. Hasn't happened yet that we're aware of. Uh, given where we are with the Fed right now, have they almost taken that off the table if they are basically are not going to raise any more? So, I'm going to say, I'd say one thing, and, I, and uh, you know, I've said it on your show a bunch of times. I really think the U.S. economy doesn't go into recession except for pandemic financial crisis, unless it's some big exogenous shock. And I'll use one stat. The service, sir, consumption in this economy is 70% services now. In 100 years, there's only been 13 quarters of negative growth in services. And, you know, you think about healthcare spend, education spend, and the demographic evolution. Things spend on experiences versus goods, commodities. It's a very, very different economic paradigm than we've been used to. My sense is, that there are some things, you know, you've got some roll off of the savings, you know, the student loan payments that are coming on. There's some things that business capex slowing a bit. My sense is that it's a very stable economy that's migrating slower. But you know, there's always this discussion about where are we in the cycle? And I just don't think cycles are like they were in a commodity oriented, energy driven economy like you saw in the 70s or so where you had big spikes in oil prices. I just think it's really different. And, and so, anyway, I think you should anticipate a slower economy, but I think people overstate the cyclical nature of it today. Rick, we've been talking about investing in bonds. Let's talk about the other side of your book, equity. Mm. Uh, going into 2024, we're looking at, uh, I would say at least valuations are pretty robust. Mm. The multiples are pretty uh, up there. Do you anticipate uh, a boost to, to uh, earnings uh, because of what we're seeing right now in the economy. It's a slowing economy, as you just said. Yeah. At the same time, it looks like interest rates may be coming back down. So, so I'd start with them. If it, so let say the first thesis, if the bond market can get you a seven, you know, mm -hmm. let's say six, seven percent return next year. Pretty good. You know, if you think about what your liabilities are, what your return, pretty good. So if you said, okay, I'm gonna take a chunk of my portfolio, put it there. So now what will the equities do? Spectacular returns this year, driven largely by seven stocks. If you strip out the seven and say, okay, what about the other 493 of the S&P 500? I would argue the multiples are not that high. I was looking at energy the other day, 10% free cash flow yield, pretty good for a lot of these. Energy defense, healthcare, you know, a lot of the industrial ecosystem, banks. Like, I think there's enough stocks. That, so if you take, what does the economy do? Economy moderates, but the level of nominal GDP 
is still really high. My sense is companies traditionally can throw off 7 to 11, 12% return on equity. If you assume that 493 stocks, your multiple is okay, interest rate comes down, and the companies can throw off 10% ROE return on equity, you should be able to get an 8 to 10, 12% return in equities. Certainly, you know, markets can move around, but if you said, gosh, I'm gonna look at over a two year time frame, I feel pretty good about not spectacular returns. And, you know, by the way, if the economy does moderate, you think the discount rate is going to come down alongside of it. So I think it's going to be one of those years. If I can get a lot of income, keep my beta in the equity market, I don't need it in fixed income. It's quality assets get you yield and income. And then I put it in the equity market. I think you can have a decent return here. Rick, it's such a treat to have you on Wall Street Week. Thank you so much. That's Thanks, Rick Reeder of BlackRock. Coming up, waiting for the other shoe to drop. We talk with Glenn August of Oak Hill Advisors on the opportunities for distressed investing in the new year. We think there's going to be an extraordinary opportunity to provide customized capital solutions to help these companies refinance. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. 2023 saw record rate hikes directed at curbing inflation, but inevitably putting pressure on debtors as the cost of borrowing money or refinancing what they already have borrowed goes up. To give us a read on how bad the stress could get and what opportunities may be presented to investors, we welcome now Glenn August. He's founder and CEO of Oak Hill Advisors. Glenn, welcome to Wall Street Week. Great to have you hey, here. Thank you for having me. So let's start on distress, sure. uh, because you have a new, I think, third fund, yep. something over $2 billion. Yep. Why did you decide this was a particularly good time to have some dry powder to maybe jump into the distress area? Well, look, there, there's, I've been doing distress now for over 35 years, and distress is an opportunistic strategy. And there are moments where distress is super exciting. Uh, there's moments where it's less exciting. And uh, our view is having capital ready to seize on that opportunity always makes sense. And as you highlighted in your opening comments, rates have gone up 500 basis points. Obviously, this week and the last couple of weeks have been pretty big weeks with rates coming down. But the extraordinary thing that we're facing is a trillion plus dollars of debt that's coming due over the next three, four years. And that debt needs to get refinanced. And as we look at the picture of that, the profile of that debt, we think that it's not going to be able to be refinanced in the syndicated markets. And so we think there's going to be an extraordinary opportunity to provide customized capital solutions to help these companies refinance. And when I look over the, over the different distress cycles over the last few decades, it was a very different opportunity. There was a big recession. There was geopolitical events, whether it's 91, 2001, 2008 global financial crisis. This time, it feels like it's not necessarily going to be a big recession although it's obviously still out there as a possibility that causes a stress cycle. This time, it's just the reality of so much debt coming due. Well, is it in some senses, Glenn, a macro event of having money essentially free for a long right. period of time, which is pretty extraordinary sure. and globally, not just in the United States, and you come off of that and there are consequences, that may be the macro event, as it were. Yeah, look, I think that the macro, the inflation that we saw over the last couple of years post-COVID clearly put a major strain on companies. And when you raise rates 500 basis points, that has a big dent in free cash flow. And a lot of companies issued debt a couple of years ago when rates were lower, and debt comes due. Mm -hmm. And so we look at that profile, again, a trillion won in the U.S. over the next three, four years. It's the highest amount of debt coming due over the next three years in any point in the last 20, 30 years in the leveraged finance markets. And there's another 300, 400 billion of debt coming due in Europe. And so I think... There's really two ways to play distressed, I think, in this upcoming cycle. One is going to be buying into those companies that you think will be able to refinance the debt and buying at discounts and we think make double-digit opportunities there. And then the second, as I said a moment ago, is providing customized capital solutions where you can layer in capital, get security because a lot of the assets are not secured, get downside protection, and then have some upside opportunity. So the rise in interest rates was a very big story for the for business sure. world. Another big story, actually, was the growth of private credit. Right. Uh, we Every single day, we seem to yep. see something new in private credit. Right. You're very active in private yes. credit, have been for a long time. Why is it growing so fast? What is the itch that's being scratched right. there? So private credit is an extraordinary asset class 
The itch that is being scratched, to use your phrase, is the demand by private equity sponsors and by non, non-private equity sponsors to get a solution to, f- to help their capital structure, either to do new transactions because they're not confident in the access to the syndicated markets, to have a bespoke transaction that provides for asset sales or business improvement, uh, to have flexibility with a partner that you've worked with for years. Uh, And the reality is that the syndicated markets, because of the proliferation of CLOs uh, and the banks withdrawing from the market in a pretty meaningful way, post-GFC, but with the increased capital requirements, it seems like it's going to be even further withdrawal. In fact, you're seeing banks do private partnerships with people like ourselves. We have a big partnership with PIMO as an example, uh, but others are doing them as well. We think that the banks aren't providing the capital. The CLOs are very structured vehicles, and while they're great vehicles and we have a very large CLO business ourselves, only certain types of assets fit in there. And so when we look at the private credit market today, the opportunity to invest in the first zero to 40% of a capital structure, zero to 45, maybe 50% sometimes, in a multi-billion dollar company, in an industry we like, with management team we like, with sponsorship we like, and the opportunity to make 10, 11, percent plus unlevered, I think is really attractive. Uh, so how big could private credit get in your adjustment? Well, because to put it in perspective, there were numbers coming out of Apollo, actually, that said uh, it's like $1.5 trillion, something like that, in private yep. credit. The balance sheets of the banks are $100 trillion. Right. So it's come up a long way, right. but comparatively, it's still relatively but modest. Let's, but let's put that in context. The leverage finance market today, the leverage loan and high yield market today is about $3 trillion. That's the liquid market in the U.S., the private credit market today, a trillion and a half. If you look at the likely demand for private credit, if you take the $2.4 trillion of dry powder in private equity funds, and you assume five plus billion dollars of deals, there's an enormous demand for private credit. And then when you think about the refinancing, there's about $600 billion of debt coming due that's rated B3 or below that will probably have to access the private credit market. And so. You can see the private credit market tripling. And I would say that if it gets to $5 trillion, that's a pretty large market. The investment grade market's 10 plus trillion. So it's a meaningful market. And I just, I just see the demand from large pension funds, from institutional investors, from individual investors. You're obviously seeing one of the big trends is, is accessing alternatives from the retail. We, we, we did a transaction with T. Rowe Price a couple of years ago, and we just launched our first product with T. Rowe Price to do a non-traded BDC to give individual investors a chance to buy private credit. So, Glenn, you have this new fund, it's your third, but you have other dry powder that you can really put into distress. Yes, so we've been investing over $20 billion of distress over the last three decades, and today we have dedicated funds, but we also manage a lot of capital for separate accounts. And so we have in total over $5 billion of dry powder. And as a practical matter, because of the flexible mandates we have, if there was extraordinary opportunities, that number could flex up from there. And so I believe having that capital to be opportunistic, to be patient, to be selective, to seize on the opportunity will hopefully yield our investors some really attractive returns. Well, it's been great having you here on Wall Street Review. Thank you so much, Glenn. That is Glenn August of Oak Hill Advisors. Coming up, eating a slice of humble pie with our holiday desserts this year. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Finally, one more thought. Winston Churchill reportedly said of his successor, Clement Attlee, he's a modest man, but he has much to be modest about. It turns out that as we move into the final days of 2023, there are a fair number of us who have much to be modest about. As we often do, we entered the year full of confidence about all sorts of things, like confidence that the Jets would finally be a contender for the Super Bowl behind their superstar $75 million quarterback Aaron Rodgers, only to lose him to injury in the very first game. Overall, his contract was about $112 million. So even if he can't play, like he's going to be OK. Republicans on Capitol Hill went into the new year confident that they could finally score some points with their new majority in the House of Representatives. But then it took 15 ballots to give Kevin McCarthy the gavel. 
There are obstacles in my life. I have fallen many times. There was a time I, I was going to be speaker and I couldn't, and you guys all counted me out. I'm speaker. I'm the 55th Speaker of the House. And he held on to it for only 10 months. The Office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. U.S. automakers went into 2023 confident that the demand for electric vehicles would give them momentum toward their aggressive goals for replacing internal combustion engines in the near future. When I look at our portfolio of internal combustion engines, I'm really excited about it. And they're doing well. The customers are responding. and We can't build enough of them. And so I'm excited about the demand. But by the end of the year, Ford was said to cut its production of the F-150 Lightning in half. And GM was redirecting some of its EV investment toward its shareholders. We never thought that the EV adoption would necessarily be a straight line. We've seen this in other markets. Uh, we're seeing it now in the U.S. But I think the thing that everybody has to remember, if the growth is slowing, it is still growing. On the economic front, China entered the new year by lifting its COVID lockdown, which was widely expected to give its economy a jump start. There's a big reopening to come in China. I don't think it's happening now. When it does happen, I think you are going to see a very strong lift in growth. To everyone's surprise, including presumably President Xi's, it didn't work out that way. And China continues to struggle with getting its growth engine back on track. I have been more optimistic about China in the past, and I will say that I have recalibrated my views. I mean, it is definitely going through a tough period. But when it came to economic expectations, U.S. prognosticators also had plenty to be modest about, as economist after economist went into the year predicting a recession that didn't come, at least yet. And markets weren't much better, predicting a mere 66 basis points in rate hikes from the Fed in 2023, and we got 150. Over in Europe, markets similarly got it wrong, predicting 141 basis points in higher rates when it turned out to be 250. So as we enter yet another new year full of expectations and predictions, it may be wise to remember Winston Churchill's suggestion that we may have much to be humble about. But as with all rules, this one is honored in the breach. And the breach in 2023 must surely be Ms. Taylor Swift. Whatever else happened this year, whatever disappointments the rest of us may have had, Taylor Swift had absolutely nothing to be humble about. What she has accomplished with her tour is unprecedented. Never before have we ever seen an artist put multiple stadium shows on sale in the same city and blow them all out. She did so well that Blackstone actually imitated her for their holiday video this year. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.